I'm on my way to Romania. The country, like its neighbor Bulgaria, joined the European Union five years ago. I want to find out how people's lives have changed since then. Farmer Tiberio Boldura wants to show me his fields. These are pompes. Alte, 40 years. But his tractor has broken down. He tells me it's very old. In the end, he gives me a tour on foot. Boldura lives in the village of Bilet in Western Romania. He's a smallholder with 12 hectares of land. His neighbor has 150. The local soil is rich and fertile. Tiberio tells me he grows alfalfa in some of his fields and wheat and barley in others. He says he receives 150 euros per hectare in EU subsidies and the extra money is a real help. That's Europe, he tells me cheerfully. But he still can't live from his farm proceeds alone. Boldura also benefits from the freedom he now has to work in other EU countries. He spends six weeks of the year working as a farm labourer in Germany, legally. When we say goodbye, Boldura gives me a parting gift. Two homemade sausages as provisions for my onward journey. I continue traveling southeast. Along the road, I pass several large factory buildings. The country's accession to the EU prompted a massive investment boom. The economy kept on developing until the financial crisis put a damper on growth in 2009. I come across a newly built road that doesn't seem to lead anywhere. It was evidently laid in the hope that more investors would come and build a factory here. But what's going on in the factories that already exist? This company makes cables for Italian espresso machines. I meet Giulia Udrea. She's a hairdresser, but for the past three years she's worked here. She has a daily quota to fill and barely has time to speak to me. Giulia earns about 250 euros a month. She says she thinks it's great that Romania is now part of the EU, but she says there's one problem. Romanians still earn very little, but prices have risen to match those in Western countries. So wages are low, and yet it still costs me 60 euros to fill my tank with petrol. On the way to Bulgaria, I find that many of the roads have been newly paved. The construction costs were shared 50-50 by Romania and the EU. I reach the Danube. The river divides Romania and Bulgaria, both recent additions to the EU. Despite their proximity, the countries have few economic or cultural ties. That's partly because there's no bridge connecting them for 400 kilometers. Where I am, there's just one ferry. I arrive just as it leaves. I end up having to wait until late evening to cross. There's no reliable timetable. The ferry departs when it has enough passengers. After a 20-minute crossing, I'm finally in Bulgaria.
The next morning, I look out of my hotel window. The Bulgarian port town of Vidin looks as if it hasn't changed in decades. One of the oldest buildings in the town is the church. Father Polika is celebrating Sunday Mass. The 36-year-old cleric studied in Moscow and spent nine years living in a remote Bulgarian monastery. After the collapse of communism, the Orthodox Church enjoyed something of a renaissance. It was able to recover property that had been appropriated by the state. For centuries, the Orthodox clergy have seen themselves as custodians of the nation. I'd like to know what they think of their country becoming a member of the biggest club in Europe. Father Polika tells me that both his church and the Bulgarian church as a whole welcomed the opening up of their country. He says the ability to move around freely in Europe has enabled Orthodox clerics to engage in spiritual exchange with representatives of the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. A practice he believes is strengthening Christianity throughout Europe. But the church in Vidin has lost almost half of its congregation in the past few years. That's because many people have moved away. The region is one of the poorest in the EU. Almost all the city's businesses have closed. Working-class residential areas are decaying. Simply hopeless. That's how this local pensioner describes the situation here. He sees no future. Ironically, Vidin was once Bulgaria's most important port on the Danube River. Residents have set their hopes on a new EU project. Zonja Matsorska's office is directly by the harbour. She works for a Spanish construction firm that's building a new bridge over the Danube here. Matsorska was born in Vidin. She spent some time looking for work abroad, but now she's back. She shows me an animated simulation of the finished bridge. Construction will cost more than 200 million euros. The European Investment Bank and Germany's Reconstruction and Development Bank are providing most of the funds. Matsorska takes me to see the construction site. The bridge's feeder road is partly finished. The bridge itself is a mammoth building site, three and a half kilometers long. More than a thousand people are working on its construction. She tells me the bridge will be the biggest ever built over the Danube. She's obviously very proud of the project. Matoska says the company and local residents believe the bridge will revive the town's economy. She says it will create more jobs, attract new investors and prompt more intensive economic and cultural exchange. At the end of my journey, it's clear to me that most Romanians and Bulgarians see the European Union as an opportunity but it's likely to take an entire generation before living standards here catch up with those in Western Europe.